This is not sustainable. That's probably the perfect sentence to summarize the economy of Brazil for the past 60 years. It has long been recognized by the Brazilian people that Brazil has failed many times at sustaining long-term economic growth. In fact, Brazilian economists often jokingly refer to the country as the flight of the chicken. As among most species of birds, chickens can only fly a distance of a few hundred feet at most. Similar to how the economy of Brazil can only grow for so long, only for all that growth to be wiped out by a severe economic crisis. A bit of fun fact for you, Brazil's per capita income was double that of South Korea in 1980. Today, it is half. Now, most Brazilians living today will probably still remember the 2014-2016 nightmare of a recession, in which GDP fell by 8% with an unemployment rate of 12%, one of the highest in Latin America. It is the worst crisis Brazil ever had since GDP was tracked back in 1901. And the effects of the crisis can still be felt today in the form of high unemployment, low investment, high public debt, and worsening poverty and inequality as millions of Brazilians lost their income and social benefits. But if we look at history, this has happened before. First, the stagnation of 1962 to 1967, then the lost decade of 1981 to 1993, the dreaded 2014 to 2016 recession, and the 2020 recession caused by the pandemic. Almost all of these crises happened right after a period of massive growth. And throughout those four events totaling 20 years combined, there are common themes that link all of these events together. You see, these boom and bust cycles that keep happening in Brazil highlight some massive structural issues that have plagued the country since the 1960s. These issues have not only held back Brazil's economic growth and prosperity during the good times, but also enhances the damage caused by the fall of commodity prices, banking crisis, political crisis, and policy errors, all of which have happened in Brazil probably too many times. This shows that a massive structural reform is key for Brazil's economic growth and prosperity, both for the short term and for the long term. So, what are the structural issues that held back Brazil's economic growth over the last 60 years? And what needs to be done for Brazil to be able to finally have a sustained long-term growth rather than chicken-like growth? Alright, so over the last 40 years, the economy of Brazil has grown by on average 2.7% per year. This is actually quite decent and comparable to its neighbors like Peru and Chile that has grown by 2.7% and 3.6% over the same time period, and certainly way more than Argentina, which has only grown by 1.2%. But there are indications over why Brazil's long-term growth rate is way more concerning than it initially looks. That is because this growth has been driven solely by population growth, not productivity growth. If we look at the total factor productivity of Brazil excluding human capital, the growth of productivity in Brazil from 1992 to today is at 0.68% on average, which is extremely low. This is important because the past 40 years have seen Brazil's population almost double from 121 million to 214 million, and is supposed to be the golden years for Brazil's economy. Yet, the low productivity of Brazil is really undoing the positive effect of its massive population growth. Besides, this population growth won't continue forever, as Brazil's birth rate has declined significantly over the past few years. If Brazil didn't solve this productivity problem, the future looks quite bleak as it will lose its only source of economic growth. But this begs a bigger question. Why is Brazil's productivity growth so low even when its population has doubled over the last 40 years? First of all, Brazil is actually a close economy that doesn't trade much with other countries. Well, it's not a completely close economy, but it is one of the least open among the G20 countries. According to the WEF, Brazil's trade penetration, aka the share of exports and imports in GDP, was only 27.6% in 2013, compared to the world average of 58.4%. And the volume of trade in goods and services relative to GDP is lower than that of Chile, Peru, Mexico, and Colombia. Part of this strange phenomenon in the 21st century is Brazil's high tariffs and trade complexity. For example, in 2020, Brazil's average MFN tariff rate was at 13.5% excluding its trade partners, and they had some very strict customs policy with high prices, 
As the government want to enhance domestic production and motivate people to buy more domestic products. The fact that Brazil has very few trade partners also didn't help at all. For comparison, this is a list of Brazil's trade partners compared to Argentina, Peru, Chile, Mexico, and Colombia. You can see that Brazil has the fewest trade partners among this group with only 13 countries excluding the EU. Chile, for example, has 38 countries without counting the EU. Now, despite its traditionally closed economy, Brazil actually had periods from 1988 to 1994 when they were trying to open up its economy by reducing tariffs and trade barriers. But that attempt was short-lived, and they quickly went back to increase tariff and isolate its economy. And this protectionism only heightened after the 2008 global financial crisis. Furthermore, an issue that many people and businesses had when shipping items into Brazil is corruption. It used to be spread out so much that you could bribe the clerks into not having to pay the duty fee. Today, it is more complicated than that, but corruption is still quite a big issue. According to Transparency International, Brazil ranks 94 out of 180 countries on the list in terms of corruption, and it gets a score of 38 out of 100 for its Corruption Perception Index. For reference, that's lower than countries like Colombia, Vietnam, Cuba, Senegal, and certainly lower than first place Denmark, which gets a score of 90 out of 100. Of course, Brazil's corruption issues can be seen in way more instances than just shipping, and we're going to talk about it later in the video. Now, another more obvious problem that Brazil had is its poor infrastructure, which has also been a drag on domestic investment. The gap in Brazil's infrastructure is quite large when compared to other emerging countries. According to this 2019 GCR report by the WEF, Brazil ranks 78 out of 141 countries surveyed for infrastructure quality. For comparison, Argentina was ranked 68, Mexico at 54, and Chile at 42. Another older 2014 report by the WEF also notes that Brazil had poor results for all kinds of transport infrastructure like roads, ports, railroads, and airports. Even in areas where it has invested more money in like electricity and telecommunication, the results wasn't even that good. Again, corruption and mismanagement might also be an issue here. A 2017 World Bank survey, for example, noted that 50% of businesses in Brazil said that electricity is a major concern for them to properly run their business. And all of this didn't even consider the most basic of human necessities, which is water. As of 2022, 30 million people in Brazil, or 14% of the population, lack access to reliable, safely managed source of water. And 109 million people, or 51% of the population, lack access to safely managed household sanitation facilities, according to an international non-profit company, water.org. Now, the poor infrastructure in Brazil can partly be explained by the next problem that Brazil has, underinvestment. For example, Brazil's infrastructure investment as a percentage of GDP for the last decade is around 2%, whereas in China, that number is 7%, and in India, 5.5%. There are several reasons why Brazil didn't invest much in its infrastructure. Brazil has a big fiscal deficit, about 10% of GDP, and that is now exacerbated by the pandemic that worsened its fiscal situation even more. Brazil had a low savings rate about 15% of GDP, that constrains its ability to finance long-term investments, its political parties are deeply fragmented, and Brazil also has a rigid budget structure in which a large part of that budget is dedicated to pensions and interest payments. To illustrate how fragmented its political parties are, Brazil had 35 political parties in 2018, with any legislation approval must be signed by the majority of them. Of course, it is very hard to make any kind of coherent decision making with all of these parties debating amongst each other. That's also why the number has been cut down to 16 in recent years, so there may be an improvement here. And about the rigid budget structure that I told you earlier, a large part of the government budget is spent on the social security system. This feels kind of odd, because Brazil still have a relatively young population. But Brazil's spending on social security is about 40% of its government's budget, comparable with countries that have older demographics. The reason for this is a combination of schemes with easy qualification rules and low effective retirement ages. 
teachers for example tend to retire at 50 years old with pensions equal to their full salary for 20 plus years. And in some states like Rio Grande do Sul, the cost of pensions for retired workers per year has surpassed the salaries of current employees. That's kind of wild if you think about it. With the population aging trend, then even more of the government's budget will go to funding pensions in the future, which is good in a moral sense, but it leaves little money for more pressing needs like functioning roads and safe source of water things that are equally as important. Exactly why a structural reform is needed so that the social security system can work long term. And another problem that Brazil has is just an all-around inefficient state. This inefficiency is evident in the tax system, regulation, labor markets, and credit policies. An article from Harvard Political Review, for example, states that Brazil's tax system is obsolete complex, inefficient, and unfair, so much so that they drive foreign investments away from the country. The article further mentions three reasons why Brazil's tax system is such a headache to deal with. First of all, Brazilian taxpayers spend so much time, money, and effort to comply with constantly changing tax rules. Apparently, people in Brazil spend 1,501 hours a year on average attempting to keep up with regulations and pay their taxes, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Compare this to 175 hours per year for the average American, which by the way, is not even that good. Second, this complexity causes a lot of confusion where even experienced lawyers and accountants seem like they don't know what they're doing at times. This raises costs for companies, produces uncertainty, and drives foreign investments away from the country as companies don't want to deal with all of the headaches. Not to mention, the complex tax rules also open up opportunities for corruption. Third, Brazil's tax rules drive inequality. They tax consumption more than income and wealth, which worsens social inequality. For example, Brazil's tax on income and wealth represent only 22% of the total tax collection. In the USA, it is 60% and in Denmark, 67%. And all of this is just regarding taxes. Brazil has been criticized by its own citizens and foreign economists alike for its inconsistent regulation, creating barriers to entry for new businesses, and encouraging bribery of public officials who has power on stuff like licenses, permit, etc. The labor market is still mostly informal in which tax evasions are common, and the credit and commercial policies are distorted and inefficient, favoring certain sectors and firms over others. It also creates opportunities for political influence and corruption by powerful interest groups. All of this has eroded public trust in institutions and is a major structural problem that hampers Brazil's development. Okay, so based on the problems that we've examined before, it is clear that Brazil needs a structural reform to sort out its problems. I'm no economist and I cannot exactly tell you how to do it. If I can, I wouldn't be making YouTube videos, but there are several things that could be considered. First of all, simplify the tax system with a priority on reducing taxpayers' burden and boosting investments in the country. Second, a major revamp in the social security system is needed as Social Security accounts for 40% of the government's spending. The key to this reform should include a higher mandatory retirement age, albeit it must be increased gradually so that it doesn't burden retirees too much. The third, and possibly the hardest one, improve infrastructure. Even the basic ones like roads and water will do wonders in the short term. Given Brazil's precarious fiscal condition, then Brazil will have to rely on private investment for this. This can be done by improving investment returns and simplifying the tax rules so infrastructure projects in Brazil may look more attractive for investors. And finally, Brazil should continue to pursue reforms to further promote the anti-corruption framework. This is an ongoing battle, and there have been major improvements over the last few years, so things are going in the right direction improve the effectiveness of the criminal justice system, and implement preventive actions to reduce money laundering and corruption risks in the long term. It should help that all of the solutions described here are politically palatable as well. This is Doverhill, and see you next time.